I'm Nora Bateson. This conference is a collaboration between two organizations, the American Society for Cybernetics and the Bateson Idea Group. The American Society for Cybernetics has this incredible woman named Pina Luna. We say it's a collaboration, but the fact of the matter is, I've been on tour with the film, and she's been doing the work. So, thank you, Pina. The Bates and Idea Group is having a big moment right now. This is our official public emergence into the world. A moment in history when these ideas of Gregory's are resurfacing and they are getting traction in a different sort of way. And I don't know what that's about, but it's great. And for me, it's been an enormous honor to see people enjoy Gregory's sense of humor, to watch them engage with his ideas, and more than anything, to engage in the kind of conversation that I feel we really need to be having right now. The crux of that conversation is about how we think, about how we see the world, how we describe the world. And in this moment in which we're facing a lot of anxiety, problems everywhere, and a breathless search for solutions, answers, it's a good time to take pause and look at the way we're looking so that we don't recreate the problems. Then it could be argued stem back to the question of how are we seeing the interrelationships and the interdependencies in our world? This is, of course, a cybernetic question. It's an aesthetic question. It's a psychological, anthropological, ecological, biological question. We titled this conference An Ecology of Ideas. And that means that we're hoping it will actually be that. But that is not a given. That's, that's going to take active participation and rebellion and a little Ooh. bit of punk rock from all of us, I think. <laughs> I'm not kidding, actually. It takes a lot of work to hold back the, the very seductive tsunami of cultural pressures that try to push us into one type of thinking or another. Cybernetics is my passion, not a belief system. Heinz von Foster triggered my interest in designing in threes when writing about triadic relationships. A triadic relationship can be compared with the interrelationship between the chicken, a hen, the egg, and a rooster. You cannot say who is first, you cannot say who is last, and you need all three in order to have all three. So, when might there be a triadic relationship between the terms recursion, paradigm, and praxis? How do I describe these terms when composing this report? How might this endeavor contribute to my designing a society I desire to be an element of? My descriptions, including the video, are intentional acts a composition that reflects my experiences and designs when nested in a cybernetic way of thinking about ways of thinking and doing. Praxis. As we look at the, the pattern of our relationships and we discuss them, that discussion is in itself part of our description. And, and within it, there is room. So I wanted to bring in a quote of Gregory's that I thought pertained to this case. And he says, the problem of trying to transmit our ecological reasoning to those whom we wish to influence in what seems to us to be an ecologically good direction is in itself an ecological problem. We are not outside the ecology for which we plan. We are always and inevitably a part of it. So that's the ecological problem where we come in. And we have a whole week to play in that puddle, to 
interact and interpret and respond and re-respond and rethink. So I hope that's what we're going to do, and I welcome you all to engage in that. Who are you? I am Felix Smith. Felix I'm Smith. I'm a physicist. I live in San Francisco. I guess I was living in Palo Alto when I knew Gregory. And I had profited a lot by reading his essay, on, well, the four-man paper on the double bind, the, uh, something about towards the theory of schizophrenia, whatever that was. And uh, that was very important for me because I was involved at that time in a double bind myself. I came from a double bind family, so I ended up understanding that situation quite well, mostly with the help of Gregory's, with the four-man paper, Botslavic, Jackson, uh, Weakland, and, and, and Basin. Anyway, um, so, um, and it had helped me get out of one aspect of the double bind, and so I was able to tell Gregory about this when I happened to see him, find him at, uh, as unexpectedly at Essel, and he was willing to talk to me about it, and he, was, he liked the story. Only thing one can do in a double bind, as, as Gregory made it clear, is simply to leave it and not do anything. You can't have a change in the system. No, you can't because you have, have a change the, of the, the system. The double binder is is going to do everything to bring you back in, and you're vulnerable to those things and so on. So anyway, uh, so I told I told Gregory this story, and then I told him that uh, the, the message that I had sent to the uh, uh, to the to the man who was giving me a secondary double bind was actually a therapist. And so I had fortunately gotten out of it, and I sent him a message, and I told him that I was not coming back, and that I had discovered that we were involved in an inadvertent double bind that was most untherapeutic. So Gregory asked me what he did then. So I said, he sent me a closing bill, <laughs> without a word, of course. And. A few months later, I happened to see him in a restaurant. I was going to say hello to him. And he looked up at me, and he looked at me, and he turned his head, and he ignored me completely. And he cut me dead. So I, well, so I told Gregory that, and he said, ah, oh, yes, double binders do not like to be told. Yeah. And that, and anyway, the one thing in addition is that I went out of there as if I felt as if I was floating on air. I knew who's boss now. <laughs> so that's what Gregory did for me, and it made a great deal of difference in my life. Also, this is a historic moment, because there was a, a conference here once before at a seminar, and Jerry Brown was here, um, along with Carol Wilder. Carol is a now, was anybody else in the room here in 1979 for that conference? <laughs> Steve Rachmanovich was here. About two months or a month and a half before Gregory died, I took a walk with him at Esalen, and we were climbing up the stairs up the side of the cliff there, and it was so beautiful. And you know how it is in this part of California down through the Big Sur coast. It's like the ecology is not an abstraction. It's actually the integration of all things of nature is really like a person right there in front of you. Gregory was, he was walking very slowly, enjoying the walk, but stopping to cough and having kind of a hard time. And he, spit up blood a couple of times and when he did this he looked at me and he said I'm an old dinosaur and I'm going to die soon but you're a young dinosaur and God help you. <laughs> and I had the privilege of looking at some of the tapes from 
from that conference, and you will too. Wednesday night, we're going to get to see some of the things from that. Those ideas that were discussed that night are as relevant today as they were then. So that begs the question, why? The hell you been doing? Why have so many years gone by that we haven't gotten anywhere? What's holding back the process of letting these ideas become part of our culture? The award you're giving me, the Warren McCulloch Award, could be considered an award for lifelong achievement. Achievement. The award I'm receiving, however, is the award for lifelong avoidance. <laughs> avoidance. Avoidance doesn't mean to just not do something. Avoidance happens when you do not something. When you do but not something. I think of avoidance as something I do that I'm proud of. It goes like this. Somebody says, why do I have to go to school? Important question. Answer, in order to learn what to avoid. <laughs> See what's done, you avoid that. That's avoidance. So I am suggesting we could shift the paradigm temporarily from achievement to avoidance. Woo. Avoidance becomes the landmark, not to forego achievement, but to dethrone it temporarily. Late at night when you sum up to yourself what you've done, <laughs> what you've achieved, I don't know if you have these late night <laughs> accountings, <laughs> one of the things you could pat your shoulder on is what you have avoided. While we speak positively of learning, Monday night, it was said that Gregory Bateson learned and learned. There is merit to refusing to learn, to refusing to learn. So someone's trying to teach me that the systems we see in place are way bigger than any particular group's ability to change it. That's a lesson I'm refusing to learn. People are trying to teach us that humans are only motivated by fear or greed. But I'm not learning that lesson is huge. Bateson wrote the article, The Cybernetic Explanation. And it's in a similar vein to avoidance and refusing to learn. He proposes that rather than pursuing the question, why did, does this happen? That a more fruitful question is, why did the other things not happen? Not. For those of us who create sentences, and I know you all do. We're aware that part of a sentence's significance comes from the alternatives we speakers and writers have rejected. The significance of a particular sentence comes partly from the alternatives we've rejected. We've named our school the School for Designing a Society. We, and you could hear think, we could have named it the school for resigning ourselves to society. <laughs> the school for fitting in and getting away with it while looking good and doing bad. There was all sorts of names. We tried to name the school for composing a society, but then everybody thought it was for singing. So we moved that name. But the significance of the words we chose came partially from the words we rejected. We rejected. Now I think I would like to introduce Governor Jim Brown. Well, I suppose I'm invited here because I was here before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 